All right, it's episode 11 of the Rapid Rating Climb series, and things are getting a whole lot harder, a whole lot quicker, as we approach 1900 ELO. We'll start with E4 in this game, and we get a Sicilian defense. If you know my channel, you know what I'm going to play. A3. Going for the A3 Sicilian. Really gambity line, popularized by Gotham Chess. Yes, I did learn it in one of his courses, which... I would recommend honestly, they are pretty good. You do have to learn a lot of the lines by yourself just through trial and error and computer analysis. It gives you a great basis. By the way, new setup, if you're new to the channel this looks like a new setup. If you've been around you know this is the old setup. I prefer it. It's my uni setup when I'm at uni because I was off for Easter. Anyway, chess. Let's take on d5 and now the queen comes out. And this is like a Scandinavian, right? This this is a Scandinavian defense, except there's pawns on c5 and a3. So who does this benefit? I would argue white. Reason being is because normally the c pawn goes on c6 to control these light squares because they're quite weak in the black position after the d pawn disappears. Now that those squares are not occupied by the pawn, there's a good chance I can take advantage of them with a knight move or something later on in the game. Sure, e6 could be playable, but e6 will either block the bishop in, or if the bishop comes out and then e6 is played, this diagonal is going to be very weak because the bishop won't be able to come back to defend. With me? Cool. So... I think I'm just going to develop normally. Knight f3, bishop to g4 could be an annoying pin, but we do have the tactic of bishop takes f7 check, king takes, knight e5 check, forking the king and the bishop, and even though this knight protects it, we'll have a knight and a queen attacking it, so we will win back the piece with the pawn on f7 as well. So will be a pawn up with further compensation because the king will have lost the right to castle. So knight f3 sets a really nasty trap. I don't expect my opponent to fall for it. He goes knight c6. And that stops the idea because now the e5 square is controlled by the knight. So bishop g4 is now an idea. Maybe not a threat, but an idea. So I'm tempted to play h3 just to stop that from happening. It does use a tempo which is a bit annoying but then the question becomes where this bishop goes. Maybe it goes to f5. Looks like a nice enough square for it. We could go d3 to try and blunt it entirely. So I think h3 makes sense. There's no rush to castle. Our king is in no danger. Um, one of the downsides of the opening is the fact that black can play a move like e5 and take a very big center but d3 and I'm happy to sit back and try and let my pieces work their magic so e6 is played this blocks the bishop so we stopped it from going to g4 our opponent clearly didn't like putting it on f5 it's not really a typical Scandinavian idea in the Scandinavian the bishop tends to go to g4 so e6 is played instead preparing to castle so I think I'm just going to castle Play it simple, bring a rook to e1 maybe, try and take some more control of the e5 square, maybe d3, something like bishop f4 or bishop g5, looks nice. And our bishop is very nice on this square. <clears throat> it can always transfer to b5 if it wants to, but obviously no need to rush anything. Let's play d3. I mean, rook e1 and d3 are interchangeable, really. Just get our pieces out. My only concern is bishop f4, knight d5 attacking the bishop and forcing a trade, which I don't think I'm a fan of. Now, bishop g5, knight d5. Then I think I take, because if we trade the dart, squared bishops off. Is that good for us? I don't know. Maybe we want to keep the dark squared bishop. So rookie one, 
I think I prefer just a bit more non-committal because I'm not sure where I want to put my dark squared bishop yet. It's a logical move, looking to play b5 and kick the bishop back. But that's kind of our argument for why a3 is a good move. Like I said before at the start, it's a Scandinavian except c5 and a3 are played. So after a6, we can argue that the move a3 was valuable because now we can put the bishop on a2. b5 will not come with tempo and the pawn on d3 helps to stop any c4 ideas to try and lock the bishop out of the game. Which is common if this pawn isn't on d3. If c4 can be played successfully by black, my bishop is going to have to try and transfer itself to another diagonal. It's very annoying to try and play. So, 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 let's see. Bishop, bishop g5 or bishop f4. I think I need to make a decision with the bishop now. Bishop e3, I have the same problem with knight here. What I could do is go bishop g5, and if my opponent tries to play a move like knight d5, if we can trade and then I can put my knight on e4, targeting the weakened dark squares once the dark squared bishops are traded off, that could be a nice idea. So that's on my radar. Okay. It's logical. This is an interesting position because there's, the center is very open and because there's, there's no pawns locked against each other or anything like that and there's not really many advanced pawns in the center either. You could argue c5 is but other than that not really. So we're looking for tactics in a lot of situations really. Queen e2 might set up ideas of bishop takes e6 in the future. Just thinking about queen e2, knight d4. Because if we take, then pawn takes, and I don't like that. Because then the c file is open, and b3 is weak. Although maybe we can just play bishop b3, actually. And then bishop b3 just keeps an eye on the c-pawn. So that's an option. But if, okay, queen e2, let's think, queen e2, knight d4, takes, he could take with the queen, but I don't think so. I don't think he will. I would assume he plays c takes d4, attacking our knight. And then where does our knight go? Because e2 is taken up by the queen. e4, we don't control well enough. So I think that's the problem, is where the knight goes. So maybe just queen d2, supporting the bishop and connecting the rooks. Maybe that's the best course of action. This opening certainly isn't that exciting, but you're not always going to get exciting openings, even though that is typically my play style. So I've got to just try and grind out this position, try and get some small advantages, play principled chess, you know, just develop the pieces to their most natural squares, make some tactical threats when possible, and see what comes of it. Chess is not always as spectacular as you might like. You know, you've got to be able to win the boring positions. So, okay, our bishop has plenty of support, so there shouldn't be any problems if this knight moves. So, hmm, might be ideas of knight e4. But the problem is, if knight takes, pawn takes, the structure is absolutely symmetrical and our opponent can just trade queens. Okay, knight d4 is a move that I was expecting and my idea is to take but now because we went queen d2 rather than queen e2 the knight has the e2 square to go to. 
which is the big difference, at least in my head. Now I'm thinking of taking here, because if he takes on c3, the bishop comes back and we're up a pawn. If takes, takes, maybe we have knight e4. And the knight's quite well situated. Blocks off this bishop's diagonal. Puts pressure on the bishop. He does have the bishop pair. But the center is kind of closed. And as long as we maintain control of e4, we can keep the center pretty closed. So that's a potential. Oh... We have knight e2. I feel like I feel like we're too passive there. I feel like that's too passive. So I'm gonna take, which looks odd, just trading the bishop for the knight voluntarily. But I think our knight will be really nice on e4. And if he does decide to take, then we have an opposite coloured bishop position. Ooh. I think he missed the bishop could retreat. This is what I was on about, like, in these kind of open center positions, there's going to be tactics. I think he must have missed the bishop can come back. Now our bishops are looking incredible. So the game is looking up. Again, I didn't do anything spectacular here. I just posed problems for my opponent, you know. Just asked him questions. And eventually, if you ask enough questions, they're going to answer one of them incorrectly, if you get what I mean. So, okay, we're not winning or anything. Don't get it twisted. Um, Bishop b3 looks natural, but I'd rather get my rooks a bit better developed first. This bishop's probably coming to c5, which could be quite nice for him. I don't really want to play d4 because it blocks off my own bishop. Maybe bishop e5. Maybe bishop e5, and then if the bishop comes to c5, then d4, and then this bishop isn't blocked out, and it can always retreat this way to the king side. We're also setting up c3, d4, or bishop b3 to keep an eye on the c2 pawn. Also stops this bishop coming to d6 because, you know, we're contesting the diagonal. I'd also like to bring the queen to f4 if possible to support this bishop. Um, but we're going to have to play c3 or bishop b3 first so that the c2 pawn doesn't fall. Queen f4 straight away, then we have. Then. Ooh. Queen f4 straight away, bishop d6. Can threaten mate with queen g4 on the g7 pawn. Not awful. Then g6 is too weakening. f6 is too weakening. We might be able to bait him with that actually. Queen f4, bishop d6 looks incredibly natural. Now we could come out this way. But again, queen g4. And the bishop's a bit misplaced. It, it just looks a bit stranded. We always have ideas of um, f4 to kick it out or bringing a rook up to e5. So I like queen f4. It does mean this bishop is a bit paralyzed for now because if it moves, then c2 drops. But we are up a pawn, so that wouldn't be the end of the world. And I don't know how he stops queen g4. Maybe he has to play something like bishop b5. To try and trade off our light squared bishop because it's putting a lot of pressure on e6. But if he goes for that, I'm trying to think, it looks like there's tactics with the bishop hanging. But I don't think anything works. I was thinking something like queen d4, but then bishop f6. So bishop d5, we can go queen g4 threatening mate. Bishop f6. If 
if he if we take there, then he takes our bishop. And I think he's good. So here, here, here. If we take first, we force him to take back with the queen. Otherwise, we're going to mate him. And then if we trade, we ruin his structure a bit. C3, D4. We're a clean pawn up. We have no weaknesses. We're down to a heavy piece end game. But our attack kind of fizzles fizzle is fizzles out so that would be a very clean way of going about it which could be good i'm very happy with this queen f4 move though um i think the queen belongs on the king's side just because of how active these bishops are and the fact we can potentially lift this rook at some point in the future like that is always an option so we've got a lot of firepower. Also reduces the effectiveness of this bishop by bringing our queen out. Just because any attack on g2, if we have something like queen g4, then the queen supports the defense. So I think I'm happy with this position. By the way, if you are this far into the video and you're still watching and you haven't skipped ahead, which I don't even know why you would skip ahead, <laughs> then... um. You know what to do. You know what to do. You you want to see more videos like this if you've watched this long. So let's not kid ourselves. Let's just drop a subscribe. You, you know how it is. You know how it is. Small channel over here. I'm I've I've got to promote it. You know. Um. Yeah, this position looks real nice, and I am just up a pawn. So even if ever even if the bishops do get traded off, like in that line that I just mentioned, I think we're good. I think I like the position, especially if we can get this pawn onto d5. Then after c3, d4, the structure is so solid. The d5 pawn is going to be a weakness forever. And I was going to say a6 would be a weakness. Okay. Wow. That's an interesting move. So I assume he wants b4 to expose the c2 pawn. Now if queen g4, bishop f6... I guess for now bishop f6 doesn't really work because we just trade everything and double his pawns. But what we could do is go bishop b3 here. And if b4 then take... Oh, we're actually controlling b4 enough times. Like, takes, 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 takes. We're up two pawns then. I think bishop b3 makes sense. If bishop b3 and he goes a4, we just drop right back. I think. And you could argue that that's good for him. But because we control b4 so well, if a4 gets played, then b5 is a permanent weakness. And we have ideas of playing moves like queen e5, forking, checkmate, and the b5 pawn. So I like it. I think it's a very practical move. And if b5 falls at any point, then this bishop can live on c4, because a4 takes away the b3 square stops the bishop from defending c2 but from c4 the bishop can block off the file to the c2 pawn entirely again very common idea in these a3 sicilian lines having the bishop shepherd this c2 pawn so it doesn't fall in a lot of cases the pawn will advance to c3 and this pawn will go to d4 if possible to create like a very strong Strolid? Solid structure. And then the bishop can drop to this diagonal and target the king like this. So yeah, a4. I feel like that's weakening. I feel like that's not good for black. Again, bishop to d6. Queen g4. And black has the same problem. 
That's an odd move. I don't really see what that does. To be honest. Queen e5 doesn't really work here. It does have a double attack, but then bishop f6, queen takes, bishop takes bishop. Not a fan of that. Maybe we win all the queenside pawns, but I feel like we can do that at any point. Like if that, I feel like that's worst case scenario. So there's no point playing for that immediately. Hmm. We. <laughs> I wanted to play rook e5, but bishop f6 again. Huh. This is not simple. Rook e2. Defending c2, giving the bishop a chance to move. That doesn't look bad. Just trying to be accurate here. We could try and get the light squared bishop onto this diagonal, but I have no idea how. We'd have to shift these pawns forward. Somehow. <laughs> And we're getting low on time, so I'm going to be quiet for a second and think about this position. Ooh, actually, if queen e5... Oh, come on. Come on. Don't, don't freeze up on me. Queen e5... Bishop f6, queen takes b5, does come with an attack on this bishop. Bishop takes bishop, pawn takes bishop. Rook c3 isn't playable because this bishop hangs. And if the queen ever takes on a4, then c2 is defended. So we could actually just clean up all the queenside pawns and then we should be winning. So I think I'm wrong. Might be best case scenario. Rather than worst. Just checking there's no threats with this bishop. But the queen can't come out to d5 because our bishop controls it. So we're all good. And the queen also can't come out to g5 because our queen controls that square. So yeah, here it would be a big mistake to take this bishop because then our rook hangs. So we can just take this. Again, queen d5 isn't playable, queen g5 isn't playable, which both threaten mate. This does defend the a4 pawn by x-ray, but we are up two pawns now. I think queen e5 is a very nice move. Very central, very hard to kick the queen out. Also hinders this queen's mobility. So we can kind of just get the pawns rolling a bit. Although it's not simple to do so. But, but we are up two pawns. So let's not complain about the position. <laughs> Just being up two clean pawns. Doubled past pawns. It's not going to be easy to get them through. I'd really like to win this a4 pawn. But it's not going to be simple. Queen is attacking here. We do have bishop takes e6 if the queen does venture in, so it's not really a threat. So, e4 looks nice. Looking for this. Oh yeah, that looks really good. I'm trying to play on the pin. If we get d5 in, that's game over. And if our opponent somehow defends it, then c4 and c3 and we can keep pushing or c4 might even be threatening d5 at some point again queen a3 is not a threat as bishop takes e6 queen is under attack by the rook and our bishop is attacking his rook so we can't do that c3 looks a little weak right now but d5 is such a big threat that it doesn't matter and this pawn can always go to c4 if we need to, where it will be defended by the bishop. If the pawn goes to c4, then the queen can take. 
because the bishop can't really go anywhere useful with the discovery. I mean, the bishop can only go to b3 or b1. b1 hangs a rook, so b3 would be the only move. And, ooh. What? That's a free bishop. I was about to say d5, but that's just a free bishop. I'm just checking there's no tricks. I don't think there is. Let's take it. This is game over. Yeah. That was a very clean game. Very clean. Very happy with that. Let's get into the post-game analysis. All right. So 87% accuracy on the game review. Opponent had 77. So a high level game. The computer pretty happy with most of the moves, but um, obviously some of them it will not be. So A3 is the move, and this video will be added to a playlist with all my games on the channel which feature the A3 Sicilian, which is an opening I would highly recommend. Like I said, I did learn a lot of it in a Gotham chess course. But if you want to check out the other A3 Sicilian games, then just go to the playlist below. And our opponent plays d5, which is a good move. But it's like a weird version of the Scandinavian, essentially. Knight c3 attacks the queen. Bishop c4. Computer doesn't love it, but that's just the kind of um, opening that I like to set my pieces up in. I phrased that really weirdly. This is a nice setup that I like to have in a lot of openings. The bishop on c4 and the knight on c3. It's quite reminiscent of a Vienna, where the pawn is normally on e4. Obviously our opponent forced to trade before we could get more of a hole on the d5 square. But such is life. Knight f6 is played. Knight f3. I won't talk too much about the opening. Knight c6. Like I said, Bishop, I just said I wasn't going to talk about the opening, but I have to show this. Bishop g4 is a big mistake. You can actually go knight e5 first, because if you take the queen, this is mate. <laughs> and so you'd have to play bishop e6 and ruin your structure. I feel like it's cleaner to take here first, just because it's way more forcing. So after king takes, knight e5, king retreat, takes, 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 up a pawn, the king is stranded, queen e6 is actually checkmate, um, and queen c4 will be checkmate if our opponent doesn't stop it. He would see this, I would hope, but I mean, you know, pawn up, opponent's got terrible king, terrible pawn structure because the e-pawn is isolated. Our opponent therefore played knight c6, and I went h3, because if I castled, then bishop g4, and the same idea doesn't work, because the knight controls the e5 square, which is where our knight needs to go to. So we'd have to play like this, but if the bishop retreats, computer argues this diagonal is too weak. I don't know how I feel about that, moving the bishop a second time, eh. I didn't want to allow this, so I went h3. e6, castle, bishop e7. Computer says it's slightly better for black, and it's probably correct, because the c pawn is controlling the d4 square, which is very important. We don't have quite the same grip on the e5 square. But it's a weird opening, and there's no way our opponent, as a Sicilian player, is really comfortable in these types of positions, because it's not normally what arises from a Sicilian, which is part of the reason I love the A3 Sicilian, because even though objectively it isn't amazing, it's just weird, and people can react weirdly to weird openings that they're not familiar in, as we saw in this game. Castle. Bishop F4 was good, which is what I was looking at, but I wasn't sure after knight d5. Apparently you take and then drop the bishop back. Looks a bit ugly. Black has a massive center here. I don't think I like this. The bishop's coming to f6. 
rook's coming to e8, this bishop's coming to f5. I feel like we're just fixing black's problems for him. So I went rook e1 instead. a6, drop the bishop back, e5, bishop g5. And the position is quite nice for black, to be fair. Queen d2, knight d4 is the right way to go about it. And okay, I want to see what the computer thinks about our move of taking on f6. It prefers knight e2, but it just looked so passive to me that I didn't want to play it. I don't, I don't know where this knight's going. Like g3, eh, bishop d6. This is not great, in my opinion. So I thought this was a pretty practical option. Whoa, the computer wants g takes to shift the king and put the rook on the open file. That's why it's bad. Okay. Well, my plan was if bishop takes, bishop takes, which is far more natural, then knight e4. And our position isn't amazing. Our opponent's got the bishop pair. But this is a very strong knight. If our opponent takes it, then the game's equal. This is just an equal game. Opposite colored bishops. I would argue our bishop is maybe a bit better than our opponents. Not sure where the, his bishop's really going. The d4 pawn blocks off a lot of the diagonals that it would like to access. So I would take this position any day of the week. However, this is just a mistake because bishop takes and we're up a pawn and our bishops are incredible. Rook c8. Ah, so bishop e5, the move I wanted to play initially, is actually the best move. Maybe I am a genius. Queen f4 is apparently a mistake. Why? Oh, bishop takes a3. His pawn is overloaded. If you take then, rook takes bishop, so you can't take it. Which is why bishop e5 was important to stop this tactic. Well, we both missed that. I guess it's still kind of a scary move to play, considering how weak your king is. Like, if something like this, something like queen e5, and you have to sack your rook to ma maintain equality. So, yeah, no, a human's not playing this. Going down in exchange for a pawn? No way. No way. So, even though the computer calls this a mistake, the only way it's really a mistake is if my opponent sacks on c3, even immediately. The computer wants rook takes c3. It's a strange idea. So I'm not really going to give it too much credit to be honest. a5 is a human move but apparently queen e5 straight away. And you have to take on c3 again with the rook. If bishop f6 and queen b5 in the same problem of the bishop hanging. So okay, I guess a5 is also falling, so it might be a bit better than the way we did it. Bishop b3, a4 is the best move, bishop drops back, and this actually maintains equality. But again, only if my opponent takes the bishop in some line, either starting with bishop takes a3, and after queen e5 taking the bishop with the rook, or taking the bishop with the rook straight away. Like I said, if we discount those lines, because I don't think that's a very human way to play, then the position is better for me, hands down, in my opinion. Feel free to, to disagree. If the move rook takes c3 is screaming out at you and incredibly obvious, maybe you should be doing the whole YouTube thing and not me. <laughs> maybe you are just a better player than me, but ah, it doesn't look right to me. It doesn't look obvious whatsoever. So h6, and yeah, that just falls to queen e5. Again, it wants rook takes c3. Our opponent doesn't do that. Queen b5, bishop c3, b c3. Rook can't take because his bishop's hanging. Bishop a8 is apparently better because it leaves the rook on the open file. So bishop c6 isn't quite as good. But yeah, queen e5 is best. 
actually the only move that maintains a big advantage. The second best move, queen h5, only maintains plus 0.9. So I think that's quite instructive. Like, the queen coming to e5 is really important. It threatens potential ideas on e6 at all times, holds on to the c3 pawn, keeps an eye on some of the squares my opponent's queen would like to go to, and just exerts overall pressure on the position. So, yeah, centralize your queen, guys. Queen e7, d4 is the move to try and play e5. So just to demonstrate if, I don't know, a move like rook f8, which looks quite natural, then d5. You can't take because you lose a rook. And you can't take with the bishop because you lose a bishop or you lose a rook. So the point is my opponent would have to play bishop d7. And here I can take and trade a bunch of material. But I can also play d6. And this queen is probably going to have to come out to f6. c4, c5. This pawn is getting glued in. This is incredibly winning for white. So that was the plan. That was the plan on a move like rook e8. But, yeah, bishop b5 just hangs a bishop. I, ha I have no idea. Like, I get that it opens the rook, but it also hangs a bishop. I guess he must have just missed that, but... I don't even see what bishop b5 was really doing anyway. Because, even if we don't take the bishop after bishop b5, b5 is still a great move. Because, again, he can't take. And we're going to go d6... Or we're going to take. So, yeah, even if bishop b5 didn't hang a bishop, d5 would still pretty much win the game. But, you know, that's chess for you. And that gets us very close to 1900 ELO. And with that, since we're at the end of the game analysis, obviously, that's going to be the end of the video. Thank you for watching, and check out the video recommended to you on the end screen.